This video is part of a series talking about the development of the human genital and reproductive systems. My goal is to leave you with an understanding of not only the binary of phenotypical male and female sex development, but also the basis for some variations or differences in sex development. In these videos, I will be attempting to answer three big questions. How do we define biological sex? What are the steps in development of phenotypical male and female genital systems? And what are differences of sex development? In this first video, I'll start with the question of how we define biological sex, and then review the basis of sex determination, and finally discuss the pathways that lead to the formation of the bipotential gonad and embryo. And the other videos will cover the development of the anatomic structures in a phenotypical XX female and XY male. So let's get started. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, the Histology Wizard. Understanding human sex development is fundamental to our understanding of fertility and infertility, to contraception, infectious disease, pregnancy, and embryonic and fetal origins of adult disease. Now we know that reproductive congenital anomalies impact both psychosocial, reproductive, and general health, and they're more commonly encountered in people with infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss. Moreover, gonadal hormones regulate sexual bone, cardiovascular, immune, and cognitive function, so it's important to understand the origin of the gonad. Now, if we think about all congenital anomalies, the estimated prevalence of genital anomalies varies widely depending on what study you look at. Mullerian defects are thought to affect 3 to 5% of live births and are much higher in those with fertility problems while hypospadias affects 1 in 200 live births. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia affects about 1 in 15,000. And there are a lot more anomalies, and they're much rarer. So although the frequency of anomalies is often debated, if we put all those known variations together, we actually get an estimate for genital anomalies as common as 1 in 100 births. And in addition, and not really surprisingly, Genital anomalies are reported in association with other anatomically related disorders, including urinary anomalies and anal rectal malformations and cloacal anomalies. Now, in these two cartoons, I'm showing the genital systems that develop in a typical 46XY male on the left and a typical 46XX female on the right. However, we know that biological sex at a genetic and anatomical and hormonal level actually exists on a continuum. What this means is that not all genetically defined XX females will have ovaries and a uterus and a vagina and make high levels of estrogen, and not all genetically defined XY males will have testes, a penis, and make high levels of testosterone. So it turns out that these continuums are actually pretty vast. There's a lot of diversity. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to consider all the variations and possibilities. So what I'll be doing today is using the conventions of male and female to describe the anatomic structures that typically develop based on genetic sex. But I do want to recognize here that gender identity is determined not only by our phenotypic appearance of the individual, but also by the brain's prenatal and postnatal development. And all of this is influenced by the environment. We know sex determination is very different from sexual identity, sexual activity, and gender identity. It's also clear that gender identity and the genetic, anatomical, or phenotypic sex may not align for some individuals. So my goal here is to use verbiage that's cognizant and respectful. What I'll be doing today is using the conventional terms of male and female to describe the anatomic structures that typically develop based on genetic sex and are referred to as assigned male at birth and assigned female at birth. Now it turns out that humans have been thinking about the origins of sex for really forever. And there's still much that we don't understand about how biological sex is determined. We know that male and female contributions, the role of semen and testes, and descriptions of the initial ambiguous embryo were actually all recognized by Aristotle. But it wasn't until the 17th century that we learned more about ovaries and ova and spermatozoa follicles, Leydig and Sertoli cells, and we actually could observe in vitro fertilization. And all of this progress, or much of this progress, was due to the development of the microscope. 
and von Leeuwenhoek in 1677 was the first person to describe sperm in human semen. It's been known since the 1950s that the Y chromosome has a male determining function, but the specific gene SRY wasn't even discovered until 1991. And SRY is often referred to as the primary regulator of male sex development. Now, since 1991, we've learned a great deal more about control of sex determination and a lot about disorders or differences of sex development. And we continue to learn more and more about these fascinating systems. Now, what about congenital anomalies? Well, congenital anomalies of the genital system have been reported for many years. Galen of Pergamon, way back in about 150 AD, is credited as the first to use the term hypospadias to describe the condition where the urethral opening on the, uh, is on the undersurface of the penis. There are a lot of references regarding the existence of Mullerian defects back in antiquity, as, as early as 300 BCE, but the first documented case of vaginal agenesis, that is of the uterus and the vagina, didn't even happen until the 16th century. So let's think about how we define biological sex. And we'll start by talking about the three levels of sex determination. The first level, chromosomal sex, is defined by the karyotypes 46XX, which leads to typical female-specific development, and the karyotype 46XY, which leads to typical male-specific development. The second level, which is sex-specific gonadal development, starts with formation of a bipotential gonad, which then typically differentiates into either testicular or ovarian tissue. Now, this process is dependent on activation of either testis or ovary-promoting gene networks, and these have parallel repression of the opposite pathway. So the gonads then make hormones that influence the development of internal ducts and external genitalia that we refer to as phenotypic sex determination. And phenotypic sex determination also includes secondary sex characteristics that I won't be talking about here. Now you may have seen these levels described as genetic sex determination, primary sex determination, and secondary sex determination. And the word the word or term sexual differentiation can also be used to describe both gonad and phenotypic development. Now, in this video, I won't be discussing genetic sex determination, and I'm going to focus instead on the development of the gonads and then the internal and external genitalia. So let's begin with the development of the gonads, that is, the paired ovaries and testes, which develop as paired structures from intermediate mesoderm lateral to the developing kidneys. So let's take a look at some early steps in formation of the bipotential gonad. So we're going to start with this cartoon which shows a sagittal section of a roughly four to five week old embryo. And we're going to look at the area of the urogenital ridge. But first let's get oriented. The developing digestive system is shown here on the left in yellow. And both the urinary and genital systems are going to develop from intermediate mesoderm by two separate yet very interwoven processes. And again, this means that anomalies of these two organ systems often occur together. So here more laterally, you can see the early precursors to the urinary system. Here we see the mesonephric duct shown in blue. And the reproductive or, or genital system develops from the more medial intermediate mesoderm, which is seen here in orange and we call this area the gonadal or genital ridge. So now let's take a cross section through this embryo and look at the same structures. So again, note the mesonephric duct laterally and the developing glomerulus of the kidney shown in red. Now this whole area here is termed the urogenital ridge. The lateral part of this ridge is going to develop into urinary structures while the more medial urogenital ridge is going to develop into the gonadal or genital ridge. I'll call it the gonadal ridge. Here you can also see the paramesonephric duct in orange, and this is important for female-specific development, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Okay, so at this point, the gonadal ridge consists of several tissues. Mesenchyme, that I've shown here colored in orange, and an outer layer of epithelial tissue called the salomic epithelium which you see here in pink. 
Now, a really important point here is that the gonads are bipotential up until seven weeks. So what this means is that this area of the gonadal ridge is molecularly and morphologically identical in XX and XY embryos. For now, the gonadal ridge has the capacity to form either testes or ovaries. Now, the mesenchyme and salomic epithelium are two important players that contribute to ovary and testis development, but we're, but we're missing one critical player, and that's the stem cells that will form the gametes, and these are the primordial germ cells. So here we see our familiar cartoon of the early embryo, cut to see that developing gut tube, in this case, um, I showed you the hindgut, the mesonephros and the genital ridge or gonadal ridge. So let's focus on that gonadal ridge for now. Now those primary germ cells of the embryo are derived from the epiblast, which means they're pluripotent. They can become lots of different tissues. So they're essentially undifferentiated stem cells, and they eventually will make the spermatozoa or oocytes. And what they do is they begin migrating from the yolk sac at around week four, and they travel along the hindgut, and they travel, and they travel, and they travel, and they travel, until they eventually reach the gonadal ridge at about six weeks. All right, let's run through this again using our cross-sectional cartoon. So here again, we see those primordial germ cells in green, and they're traveling and traveling along the hindgut until they finally populate the gonadal ridge. Now, once those cells get there, they have an inductive influence on the gonad, and that helps it differentiate into ovary or testis. So under the influence of the primordial germ cells, those salomic epithelial cells, again those cells in pink on the outside, are going to penetrate into the mesenchyme and eventually form the support cells of the primary sex cords. Now these cords will form the ovary or testis. Okay, let's summarize where we are now. We have three basic populations of cells which are going to interact and become different populations in the gonad. First, we have those primordial germ cells that will become the gonocytes, the oocytes in females and spermatogonia in males. Second, we have the somatic support cells that are derived from the salomic epithelium, and those will become the follicle cells or granulosa cells in the female and Sertoli cells in the male. And finally, we have stromal cells, and these are cells that are derived from that orange mesenchyme that will give rise to thecal cells in females and Leydig cells in males. And these cells both produce androgens. Again, I'll talk more about male-specific and female-specific gonadal development, including genetic control, in separate videos. So now I'd like to move on and review phenotypic sex determination. So once the sex-specific gonad is determined to be an ovary or a testis, then phenotypic sex depends upon the action of different hormones released from cells within the gonads. So first, we're going to take a look at the development of the internal ducts. Here's a simple cartoon of the bipotential gonad plus the two major ducts involved in development of internal genitalia. The mesonephric or Wolfian duct seen here in blue, critical for urinary development and male-specific development, and the more lateral paramesonephric duct seen here in orange, that are critical for female-specific development. So from this bipotential embryo, we now have two typical developmental pathways. Under influence of hormones from the testes, most notably testosterone and anti-mullerian hormone, the paramesonephric ducts are going to regress, but those mesonephric ducts will become the epididymis, the ductus deferens, and the seminal vesicle. Alternatively, in the absence of anti-mullerian hormone, the paramesonephric ducts will form oviducts, uterus, cervix, and upper vagina. And that lack of testosterone means that the mesonephric ducts regress or degenerate. So let's review. The mesonephric tubules give rise to the efferent ducts in males, and the mesonephric ducts give rise to the epididymis, ductus deferens, and seminal vesicles. So both these tubules and ducts, or parts of them, are going to remain as a few remnant structures in females. Conversely, the paramesonephric ducts give rise to the oviducts, the uterus, the cervix, and the upper vagina in females. And again, there are just a few remnants that remain in males. So that's the internal ducts. 
what about the external genitalia? Well, it turns out that hormones are also responsible for driving external genitalia development into typical male versus typical female structures. So let's look at a series of cartoons to explain this process. So the first step that needs to happen is that the cloaca, which is a shared component of the anal, rectal, and urogenital passages, so that is sort of the first ex part of the excretory system, it has to subdivide into two separate channels. That is, this happens about between week about six and seven. So in this first cartoon on the left, we're focusing on this blue structure called the urorectal septum, and that's going to divide the cloaca into two chambers called the urogenital sinus and the anal rectal canal. And I kind of think of this as if you've taken a large open concept room and then framed up a wall that divides it, for example, into the kitchen and the dining room. So the urogenital sinus is going to actually have two parts, a urinary segment and a phallic segment. We're really going to just focus on the phallic segment here. So in this next cartoon, where you see the bipotential external genitalia at about five weeks. The first thing that happens is the mesoderm that's cranial to the phallic segment of that urogenital sinus is going to proliferate and expand to form a structure called the genital tubercle, which will eventually begin, become the glans penis or glans clitoris. We then see two swellings or folds that develop from endoderm on either side of the urogenital plate. And these urogenital folds will divide both into urethral folds and anal folds. And finally, we have another set of swellings or proliferation called the labial scrotal swellings that appear on either side of the urethral folds. So what happens to all of these structures? Well, basically, these structures will grow and elongate, and the folds will fuse together in males and remain unfused in females. But a key point here is that without testosterone, the external genitalia appear typically female. More specifically, dihydrotestosterone, which is converted from testosterone by 5-alpha reductase, is important for driving development of typical male structures, such as the penis and the scrotum, from the three tissues we just talked about. And then absence of DHT results in unfused structure that, that are more typical of female genitalia. So let's review. Here we see the genital tubercle in yellow, the urethral folds in pink, and the labio-scrotal swellings in purple. In the male, under the influence of dihydrotestosterone, the genital tubercle will lengthen and form the glans penis, the urethral folds will lengthen and fold up and fuse, forming the penile urethra, and the labioscrotal swellings will fuse together at the midline to form the scrotum. In the female, without the action of dihydrotestosterone, the genital tubercle becomes the glans clitoris, the urethral folds do not fuse and remain as the labia minora, and the labioscrotal swellings also remain unfused, forming the labia majora. So that's it for part one of reproductive development. Thanks for stopping by.